Good evening, Carlo Borghini speaking from the Shift to Rail joint undertaking. Uh, we are waiting that uh, all the attendees will uh, enter the webinar uh, session dedicated to the uh, Hyperloop uh, technologies. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm really uh, glad to have the opportunity to uh, moderate and uh, host this uh, session together with the other colleagues. Uh, we'll have an in 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 interesting discussion about Hyperloop technologies with uh, uh, European and non-European uh, promoters. Uh, and uh, it, it will allow us to explore um, Hyperloop from different perspectives, but also we'll have the view of the European Commission and from the uh, Joint Research Center of the European Commission. So it, we will have a really a panorama of uh, uh, the, what is the work ongoing at the moment uh, uh, in the different uh, uh, Hyperloop uh, uh, by, done by uh, the Hyperloop promoters, but also the institutional uh, vision about it. Uh, why to host uh, such a session inside the Shift to Rail Innovation Days? Uh, because we are supporting the European Commission in uh, an activity that is uh, uh, related to the uh, definition of a possible framework uh, for safe operation of Hyperloop technologies. Once these will be ready to uh, uh, enter in uh, future operations. And this is really the, the type of work we are doing together, but also there is another key aspect is the uh, technology transfer that we can have and the benefit we have to look at the different uh, opportunities, uh, both in Hyperloop uh, technologies, as well as in the rail system technologies. So for, for us, there is a double interest in working together from uh, this point of view. Uh, I'm here today with a, a, a representative, as I, said, as I said, of the Hyperloop technologies. And uh, I, we have representative of the European Commission uh, we, have, uh, we are waiting that uh, Mr. Fitch, uh, uh, head of unit uh, of rail safety and interoperability from DigiMove joins us, but his uh, colleague, uh, Carlo De Grandis, is already with us. Uh, we have uh, uh, with me uh, Goraz Marinic, that is the program manager of Shift to Rail. Um, next, please, Sandra. And in between the speakers, uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Pomczek, uh, Shemek uh, from a CEO of Nevomo, that is uh, before was called Hyperloop of Poland. Just Giegel, co-founder uh, and chief technology officer of uh, Virgin Hyperloop. Bruce Kemp, director of safety and regulatory compliance in Virgin. I think Mars is uh, with us or will join soon us. Um, Mark Goes from uh, uh, co-founder of Art Hyperloop. Michael, Mike Hanks, Head of Operation and Acting Safety Lead, Hyperloop Transport Technologies, and Charles Janssen, Head of Business Development, Development Europe of the HTTD. Dennis Tudor, Co-Founder and CEO of SwissPod Technology, and Leonard Karsunki, uh, Co-Founder and CMO of SwissPod Technology also. We have Sebastian Gendron, Co-Founder and CEO of Transport, David Pistoni, CEO and Co-Founder of Zeleros, and Costantino Gumas, uh, Program Officer, Scientific Research Joint Research Center of the European Commission. The order is also the order uh, through which we'll go in the presentation uh, that has been also uh, taking into account the availability of the different speakers. As you can see, we have a quite uh, wide uh, participation in terms of panelists today. How we run it? Uh, I will be uh, supported by my colleague uh, uh, Goratz. Uh, but in principle, we'll have uh, a statement of four or five minutes uh, um, uh, from the different uh, panelists. And after, we have a series of questions uh, that uh, I'm pretty sure uh, we will be able to have between us as panelists. But also, I would like uh, uh, and I would be happy uh, if uh, uh, all of you that are following the, um, the attendees who are following the, this webinar uh, would be happy to, to introduce uh, questions. How we can do it, it can be done uh, raising your hand uh, uh, and you have uh, under your screen, you have a bar where you can put uh, um, raise your, your hand near to your name or in case send to us uh, in the chat comments uh, that we are able to see and we will try to bring your question uh, to the uh, panelists during the, the conference. We have more or less together one hour so uh, I think should be sufficient to have an interesting discussion and to, to explore the world of Hyperloop and the, how it's presented by the different promoters. And finally, we'll have a final statement uh, by uh, each of them and we conclude our session. 
Uh, but let me start, uh, uh, first of all, with uh, uh, a, uh, setting the scene. And the setting the scene will be done by the European Commission. I think uh, Kier Fitch, the head of unit of the Indigenous Move uh, Rail Security, joined us, if I'm not mistaken. Kier, Indeed. are you there? Hi, Carlo. Yes, I'm here. Uh, and uh, hello, everybody uh, from Brussels as well. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join you for this meeting. Uh, just let me set the scene very briefly for you. Uh, of course, uh, work on Hyperloop for us is a, uh, a very high priority uh, because Hyperloop is one of the things we, we want to be encouraging at a European level. Uh, we see Hyperloop as a technology which certainly has great potential to add to the transport mix and therefore help us meet the, the very tough uh, um, criteria that we've set ourselves under the Green Deal for uh, achieving a zero greenhouse emission, low energy transport uh, system. As you know, with uh, I think now the target of reducing emissions by 55% by 2030 and going essentially to zero emissions by 2050. So that's something we need to find all modes possible of achieving and Hyperloop we see as having a lot of potential to get us there. We also think that work on Hyperloop uh, will have the potential to spin over to give us uh, research outputs that may well be relevant in other transport areas. Perhaps, for example, there, there may still be uh, new life in Maglev, uh, but certainly some of the work that we will uh, do or that we see you doing on traffic management, etc., has read across to many other areas of transport. At the same time, of course, Hyperloop is quite speculative. It's a new technology with a lot of potential, but we really do need to work with you to see precisely what role it would, could, and should take in the transport mix in the future. So as I said, not putting all our eggs in one basket, Hyperloop is something we want to support, we're interested in, but we also do have to look a little bit skeptically to make sure that really economically it makes sense that we get all the safety cases right, et cetera. But that's where going forward, we and we're working with Shift to Rail uh, very much on this, and we hope that the successor to Shift to Rail that uh, uh, is in the uh, in the pipeline uh, will also do uh, a lot of work uh, to support Hyperloop. Uh, but we we've already set up, and this has now been going for I think eighteen months or two years, a an institutional task force within the uh, European Commission involving not only DG Move, so the Transport DG but also the research directorate, um, our industry director general and RTD, the, uh, the main uh, research DG in the commission. And we've been working with them and with our transport regulatory agencies. So the rail agency, the aviation safety agency and the European space agency, which is not actually an EU body, uh, but we broke them in anyway, because of course, as we develop Hyperloop, we need to learn from the various existing nodes, uh, what are the appropriate standards, what are the appropriate regulatory uh, modes that we could use to ensure uh, a suitable regulation for Hyperloop in the future. And of course, clearly we're looking for something that will allow the technology to grow and develop, uh, ensure as far as possible interoperability between systems, uh, and of course, fundamentally, which will ensure safety, but at the same time, ensure that it's as as light touch and as appropriate regulation as possible. So that work's been ongoing for a while. Uh, we've now set up a study on a potential regulatory environment uh, to look at that in a bit more detail. Uh, there's also been a lot of work ongoing uh, in the context of the European standardization bodies, uh, SEN and SENLEC. Um, we've also set up a coordination uh, group uh, jointly with the uh, the seven EU and North American Hyperloop promotion companies. Uh, and again, this has been meeting quarterly to assess developments, uh, to see how we can best uh, assist in the development of Hyperloop. And quite a lot of that assistance so far has come actually by looking at, at this regulatory structure that I've just been referring to. Uh, but clearly also we've been looking at how we might assess, assist in terms of uh, research projects uh, and there was some work early on, though I don't think this has progressed uh, in terms of whether there may be some kind of joint uh, research centres created. So a lot of work's ongoing. Uh, clearly, if Hyperloop uh, develops in the way I think uh, many of you hope it will, 
then probably the next step would be the creation actually of a regulatory structure at a European level uh, that would then uh, allow you to start really building systems that could be uh, commercialized and put into service. I don't think we're quite yet, yeah, quite there yet, but clearly if Hyperloop is to play an important role in the, the future zero emission transport, uh, we would expect to get there pretty quickly and certainly to work with you on understanding when it is we need to come in and act. So I'll stop there, but I'm of course staying online, uh, listening to everybody else and we'll be happy to uh, engage in questions and discussion later. Many thanks, Carlo. Thank you very much, Kira, for your presentation. It was uh, uh, absolutely uh, the correct one to set the scene and to uh, indicate where we are and the level of ambition that we have uh, in Europe. Uh, now we'll go before the question, we'll go through the presentation by, uh, and the statement by each of the Hyperloop promoters. And I will start, as I said, in the order of the availability of the people with the CEO of Nevomo, uh, Shemek, are you there? And ready to- Yes, yes, I'm there, I'm ready. Thank you very much. Zanda, can you put up the presentation? Perfect, everything is working. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, great to, to be the first one to speak. Thank you for this opportunity of giving the floor first to something that may seem as the youngest player in the Hyperloop family. Well, actually it's not because uh, we've been around as Hyper Poland for around uh, three and a half years already. And last week we changed our brand name to Nevomo. Uh, thank you also, Carlo, for great pro pronunciation of my name. I know it's not, not so easy. And let me say in a few words what we've been doing and what's our approach to Hyperloop. Next, please. So uh, we have decided to take um, an approach to the Hyperloop te technology, which is gradual on one hand. And on the other hand, it brings all the value that's hidden within existing railway infrastructure in a way that it's welcoming uh, broad cooperation between the Hyperloop as the new Nastin system and also the existing railway, um, railway ecosystem. So we propose to implement this technology in, in two stages. Stage one is called MagRail, uh, which integrates a magnetic levitation and linear motor with conventional railway track. So we can operate two systems on the same line, but this propulsion and levitation is compatible with Hyperloop. So we believe this will be a huge important step towards interoperability between existing conventional railways upgraded hopefully to MagRail and then uh, the Hyperloop. We see it as a cheaper and faster alternative to building new conventional high-speed lines because this takes a lot of time. Um, and its beauty is also that it can later be transformed into a Hyperloop system. Uh, so for us, Hyperloop stage two is either upgraded migrate infrastructure or, or a new corridor. Uh, of course, we see uh, there's going to be a cha challenge in building a pan-European network uh, connecting the whole continent will, will take quite a lot, long time. Uh, and as we have on our team um, a person who was responsible for building the Shanghai Maglev Transrapid, uh, we, we are trying to avoid these uh, risks of repeating Maglev as a just very niche system, point-to-point -point de destination. And that's why we are underlining this interoperability issue. Next, please. Uh, we were also asked to uh, to give some comments on on the role of shift to rail and and the financial frameworks in within the EU, uh, and we believe that um, the most important issue from our respect our from the whole industry perspective is that new technologies such as Magrail or, or Hyperloop should be treated 
in a similar way that co as conventional existing systems. But also taking into account the fact that, of course, we are at a different level of, of development and probably we, we need, because of this, some more, more support. We strongly be believe in a cooperative approach, especially one including on one side startups and on one existing railway suppliers, railway ecosystem members, we, we are convinced that this kind of cooperations can uh, lead to great results. Uh, we would like also to propose that in, in spite of only uh, finan of financing R&D and, and innovation, um, new instruments should also help to uh, develop and finance new, new mobility strategies or feasibility studies or homologation and, and this uh, formal, formal uh, issues related to, uh, to new technology. We would also like to underline that uh, there's this um, transition period dilemma linked to new technologies. They are not at scale at the very beginning. So, so the financial parameters might not be perfect and there's a need for additional financing for this. Uh, and we would like to see a, a comprehensive European new mobility strategy, which, which would guide all developments in, uh, in this area. Next, please. So that's it from our side. Um, Thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer your questions. Perfect, uh, Przemek. Uh, we will do it later after all the presentation. I hope you will be able to stay with you or your colleagues. Uh, now we go to the other side of the Atlantic. We have Hyperloop Virgin. And from my notes, uh, it should be Josh Kegel to uh, have the connection or uh, will be you, Bruce? I think Josh is ready to go, Kelly. OK, perfect. Josh, the floor is yours. Hi. Hi, Carla. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm Josh Geigel, co-founder, chief technology officer here at Virgin Hyperloop. Uh, welcome to our DevLoop site here in Las Vegas. And we're here today to really just talk about the opportunities for Hyperloop, the opportunities for, I'll say, creating a new mode of transportation. So a lot of questions we get, why Hyperloop? Why now? And we see this as a huge opportunity for not just a new mode of transportation, the 21st century solution to a 21st century problem, which is higher capacity, it's higher demand for both people for cargo. So we're talking about systems that are in excess of 20,000 passengers per hour. And when we look at the ability, the application of this technology, we see the potential to not just get people quickly on demand, direct to their destination, and at a speed that's comparable to an aircraft, think Amsterdam to Brussels in less than 20 minutes, you're able to do it using 10 times less energy than a conventional aircraft. And doing that in a seamless, in a quick way, that I think is something that really the, the new deal, the green deal is really out there to go after. I think this technology can do it. It's the capacity to, the capacity to do it. It's also the ability to create a new type of ecosystem from a new form of connectivity. We're talking about building out the future of the 21st century, potentially on 18th, 19th century technology. And that's something that we ultimately need to change. Our system is zero direct emissions, fully electric, magnetic levitation, electromagnetic propulsion inside of a tube at a low pressure. It's like flying at about 200,000 feet or about 50 kilometers of altitude. So when we look at the opportunities here, we're here at our test facility, as I mentioned, in, in Las Vegas. We began constructing this facility about four years ago uh, towards the end of 2016. And since then, we've run about 500 tests. We've run a couple hundred hours worth of testing on this. And the beauty of this is like, if you think back to what the Wright brothers, as they became the first people to fly, what their real insight was is that you need practice time. You need innovation time. You need a facility to be able to build, to test, to get better and better. And so this was our gen one, that's about four years old. We've taken those hundreds of hours of tests, the multiple testing, we're in the process of doing more testing today and taking that to the next level into a commercial system. So. We've operated the first full-scale Hyperloop in the world. We've done that for the last four years. And I think this is a lot closer than, than most people think. And so when we see the opportunities coming down the road, we're looking at moving from a prototype into a production level system, into a certification level system, working with 
uh, regulators around the world, both in the US, in Europe, in India, in the Middle East, to really bring this new technology to the forefront. But more importantly, it's about doing. It's about the experience that you gain from building, from testing, that allows you to make leaps and bounds and moving faster and faster. We just recently announced a Hyperloop certification center, uh, and that will give us that longer term, longer distance test track to be able to do these certification activities, be able to welcome the opportunity for insight. We've been working with an independent safety assessor for over the last year and a half, working through some of the processes, becoming familiar in Europe with the way that these things ultimately need to get moved. And I just say like, personally, like this is the opportunity to do something different. We have the ability to build a new transportation system, taking the learnings, taking the opportunities from all of the other modes that are out there, the lessons learned from those opportunities. And more importantly, making people live the way they wanna live, work where they wanna work, get the goods they wanna give, enable us to live the way that we want to live as humans. In this COVID situation, we saw how just, just how much personal and connectivity and interconnection is really there with desire for that, this is going to allow us to do that without destroying the planet. We think about you know, places like the Middle East, you could cover this with uh, solar panels. You can move about 50 million passengers a year with just the power of the sun. That's the opportunity that's here. We've been really excited about the progression of really, I started this in a garage about six years ago, almost to the day. And we've seen an industry-wide, there's a number of other companies on this call. There's a number of other industries in the field. The fact that regulators in the US and Europe and across the world are taking this seriously, people are hungry for something. And people are hungry for this technology. We've got some really big things coming very, very soon. I'm more than happy to start sharing you, bring, bringing you part of the journey of how we're gonna change the way people move as we go forward. Uh, for the rest of this time, I gotta get back to some testing. So Bruce is gonna take over for me, but thank you, Carlo, for the invite and looking forward to all that's to come. Thank you, Josh. You know, I am quite jealous because you are able to broadcast from the US Las Vegas and today this morning we had a problem to broadcast in Brussels. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's good. It's, uh, it's beautiful out here in the desert. It's starting to get cold again. Um, and we welcome everybody to come out once the, we get all these travel restrictions uh, under control. But uh, there's no place like a test facility, I'll tell you yeah. that. Thank you very much again, Josh. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, Mars is not yet connected, so we are checking oh, if... Uh... I should be connected. Ah, I don't see you in the room, <laughs> but it's good that you are there. Thank you, Mars. Can you see me? I cannot see you, uh, but uh, if you are there, it's fine. It's absolutely <laughs> fine. Uh, you cannot see me, oh, because I'm, uh, I can see myself. Filming. Ah, now it's perfect. Now we see you. Great. Yeah? Okay. Your Great. five minutes are going on. Yeah, no, so the... Um... Uh, you just saw the outside of a pipe. We thought it would be fun to also show you uh, what the inside of a Hyperloop uh, looks like. Uh, so my name is uh, Mars. I am uh, I'm one of the founders of Hart Hyperloop. And before that, one of the founders of Delft Hyperloop. Um, and uh, yeah, what we would like to show you today is a little bit of the, the workings of a Hyperloop system. How does it levitate? How does it propel itself? Uh, how do you switch lanes? Uh, and tell you a little bit about what we're going to do also uh, in the future. Uh, where we are right now is our test facility here in Delft. Uh, it's, a, it's a 30 meter pipe. So obviously we cannot go at very high speeds yet, but what we can show is all the, all the crucial core systems of a Hyperloop in a low pressure environment. Uh, and we've built this facility uh, between 2018 and 19, uh, together with a broad ecosystem of, uh, of partners that co-developed all these different subsystems um, um, in the Hyperloop. So for example, a party that develops the, 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 the tracks with us, the motor with us, really building up such a, a broad group of parties. And the result is this first uh, test track here in Delft. Uh, and um, what we're now also moving towards afterwards is uh, a, a building a new test facility in the province of Groningen, in the north of the Netherlands which will serve uh, both as a facility where we can prove all the cargo operations, uh, but also show how a Hyperloop works at, at very high speeds. Uh, but uh, let's first uh, just go into the good stuff and show you how a Hyperloop works. So I'm gonna switch to my uh, colleague who will um, explain some of the, the features here. So uh, go ahead, uh, Stefan. My name is Stefan and I'm an infrastructure engineer at, uh, at Art. Um, and basically the basics of a Hyperloop, take a train, um, interchange the wheels 
by a magnetic ventilation system and remove all the air around the train um, to decrease the drag. And that's basically what we did here. So we have a full scale vehicle here, uh, 1,000 kilos per meter, um, and then we add up to the same ratio, weight to length ratio, as a full scale hybrid. So we can actually test our magnetic system here at full scale, full scale weights. And basically, what we do is we have two uh, magnets, which are and, and two tracks to levitation beds. So we lift ourselves and the entire vehicle up towards these these tracks and kind of levitate with a certain gap um, to this track. Um, how we do this? Is take an ordinary refrigerator magnet and a plate of steel. If you let it, in, if you hold it under it and let it go, two things can happen, right? It can either stick to steel or it can fall. Um, and that means that there should be some kind of, well, let's say, magic point where we where we explode. Um, we try this with our with our ordinary magnet. This is very uh, very unstable. So what did we do? We have a magnetic coil wrapped around the permanent magnet. And once we get it too too close to the track, we send a positive current through these magnets. The, the uh, sorry, negative uh, current through these uh, through these coils. Uh, the total uh, magnetic force drops. So we, we fall a bit, and if we are get too far from the tracks, we do it the other way around. And that's how we basically well, balance ourselves underneath these tracks. Um, in these tracks that you can see here on top, is also the motor cable, and this is this is basically our motor system. So by running a voltage through these uh, current through these uh, through these cables, we can actually propel um, and decelerate the uh, vehicle. Um, then our, how do we steer in this in, in our system? Uh, we have two guidance tracks. So basically, we have two magnets, and by, by centering ourselves between those, those tracks, we can actually center and steer the vehicle. This is also a great, uh, also a great feature for our switch lane switching. And if you follow this guidance track from above, you can actually see that perhaps this switches turns out in a side side and you see the levitation track getting wider and wider and wider until the point where it's actually wide enough to split up. And these, this is the official point where the hybrid is, is switched in our facility. And now the people are either hanging on these two tracks or it's hanging on these two tracks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's basically the, the, the base of our system. So the beauty of such a switch is, of course, that there's absolutely zero moving components in the track to switch, which allows you to really get network effects of vehicles merging in and out into these pipes without ever having to slow down for other traffic, allowing these very high frequencies that uh, Josh was also talking about. Uh, so I think that was the, that was a little tour. I think uh, all the other uh, parts about uh, the future and economics and so on will be for the, the question round. So uh, thank you all for uh, thank joining you, Mars. us. Thank you, Mars. I was invited with Carlo to come, and I think also Constantinos was there to see these, uh, the demonstration of your switch. And I remember it was uh, Commissioner Boots there, and she took me aside and said, simple like this, I cannot say publicly, you need to make it happen. That's all. And that is the reason <laughs> why uh, I am, I am uh, so proud to be part of, of uh, this work is going, going on uh, the hyperloop technology. Thank you, sure. Mark. Thank you. Uh, we go now to uh, a video that uh, uh, will introduce uh, uh, Mike Engst from HTTT. HTT, sorry. Uh, Zanda, can you launch the video? Hi, my name is Michael Hengst, the Head of Operations and Acting Head of Safety for Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. I would like to explain you something about our company guide you through our current developments and give you an outlook of what's coming next. First of all, I have to apologize because I wanted to film this in front of our R&D test center in Toulouse. But unfortunately, due to the COVID situation, this was impossible. So instead, you're seeing me here in Barcelona where I'm located. Uh, this is where we have our digital office and several of our central functions uh, are located here. Okay. Let me speak a little bit about the company. We were founded in 2013, right after the white paper that was published by Elon Musk named Alpha. So we've been working on this already seven years, and we're trying to make the Hyperloop a reality. Our headquarters are based in Los Angeles, in the US, but we're actually a very European company, and I'll explain you why. 
Actually, the biggest part of our workforce and of our partners is based here in Europe. We have two major sites here in Europe. Front Casal, near Toulouse, is our R&D test site. There's our 320 meter test track, which I will explain a little bit later. And it is our European headquarter. And then we have our Barcelona office, where I am located. There are a few of our central functions, but especially we're running all of the digital developments from here. Our app, our virtual windows, etc. In Europe is also where the biggest part of our industrial partners is located. And I will go through the list a little bit later to give you an idea. And then last but not least, let's not forget about our crowdsourced extended workforce. Many of our contributors in our unique operational model are coming from Europe. So you see, a big, important footprint here in Europe, a big, important value add here in Europe for the technological advancement. And we're working with many companies. Let's mention a few. We have designer companies like Crispin and Goody and Marmodi. We're working with many of the big European engineering companies. Our capsule actually comes from Artificial in the south of Spain. The tube segments also come from Spain, from the north. They all have been mounted together by a French company in Toulouse. We have labeled as the ones who have developed our uh, vacuum system. We have HHLA in Hamburg, Port of Hamburg, who are our joint venture partner for the development of the Freight Hyperloop. And then let's not forget about TÜV Süd, who work with us on the certification guideline for Hyperloop systems, a generic certification guideline. And Munich Re, who helped us with the insurance. So what has been achieved so far? Obviously, the most visible progress is in our test track in Toulouse. What we're looking at there is a 320 meter long full-size test track. Tubes of four meter diameter, spanning over pylons, which in this case are a little bit lower than they would usually be. And there is the near vacuum environment inside of that tube, powered by our vacuum container, which our partner label has provided, which keeps it at a permanent pressure of below 100 PA. We have our operations control center, which is supervising the whole testing and is preparing for the in-service operation at a later point. And then not to forget our capsule, a carbon fiber, 32 meter long capsule with a material that we've called vibranium because it is full of sensors allowing us to do all kinds of readouts of the capsule at every moment of its life. And all of that together is testing the system integration and the major functions of the system. I want to come back quickly to the advantages of the Hyperloop system. We're talking at a very fast, very flexible mass transportation system, which is incredibly sustainable with a very low CO2 footprint. And this is a technology that can be rolled out rather quickly. If all stakeholders agree and work together on this, then we can make Hyperloop a reality also in Europe in a very short time frame. Thank you, uh, Mike, for the video. Uh, we will come back to you and Charles for the question and answer. Uh, now we I give the floor to SwissPod. I think uh, Denis, you will, will be speaking or presenting something. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And um, starting with the presentation of Virgin, I think uh, let me congratulate them for the test that they have been doing in the last uh, five years. So we'll talk on the same line too. So the SwissPod Technologies was founded in 2019 by two engineers and multiple award winners of the SpaceX Hyperloop competition. Uh, and one of them is also doing a PhD in, uh, in the Hyperloop operation systems uh, in uh, Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne. And together they lead a team of uh, 29 passionate and highly competent engineers uh, with uh, different backgrounds from CERN to SI and the YATA. Um, we developed two different products. So we are focusing really on the pod and manufacturing the pod solution, but also to come up with an infrastructure design. The pod is it's a highly specialized electrical vehicle that uses magnetic levitation to travel inside a, a low pressure tube at sonic speed. 
Our aim is to design the most disruptive technology in terms of energy efficiency and cost, therefore offering a sustainable and affordable Hyperloop solution to the world. So uh, towards the end, we envision an energy autonomous vehicle uh, through a passive infrastructure in order to reduce the cost. So our, our mission is to reduce the price of an infrastructure by increasing the complexity of the capsules. The solution reduces the cost uh, as well as the operation. So we do uh, have a design with a compact and energy efficient um, yet powerful system that can be propelled uh, at sonic speed. So in terms of, uh, we have diff many different partners here uh, and the last uh, two technical partners that we got on board in the last month, uh, it's, uh, it's ABB and CERN. So we have been working on the, um, on the vacuum and propulsion uh, uh, technology with CERN, uh, as well as with ABB for the converter side. Um, and uh, in terms of testing and in terms of results and in terms of uh, really uh, what really matters uh, for, such a, for such a technology, we have been uh, working to test the vacuum of our infrastructure in the last few months in Lausanne. And we started a, a series of uh, 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 manufacturing the, 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 the tube here. So we are gonna start mounting probably by the next year uh, a very uh, a very long, let's say, a very long uh, uh, distance uh, uh, tube in order to test the propulsion system for high speeds and long distances. So this is the stat status at this moment. Uh, and I would be happy to answer the questions uh, for the Q&A session. Thank you, Denis. Really appreciate it because you kept also the time. So uh, now I give the floor to uh, Sébastien Gendron. Sebastian, I think uh, you are there. Yeah, I'm there. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, uh, good afternoon for people in Europe. Uh, good morning for those who are in North America. Uh, so I'm Sebastian Gendron, CEO and co-founder of Transport, the, um, the Canadian, I would say, uh, Hyperloop slash uh, tube transportation uh, company. And we have activities uh, in uh, Europe, more specifically in uh, France and Italy, as well as uh, in Canada. And in Canada, we're based in, uh, in, uh, in Toronto. So uh, I'm pretty pleased uh, to see all those companies and all the work and so on. There's definitely a good momentum. And uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, uh, the uh, European Commission as well to, uh, I would say, respect the mandate to support uh, emerging technologies, which is not the case uh, everywhere. And it's, uh, it's uh, I would say, leading uh, by example. And, uh, and thanks again for that. Um, I'll say a few words about what we do and the next steps. Uh, as I mean, for the audience, as you can probably uh, see, there's a uh, uh, different companies, different technologies uh, moving forward. Uh, so it's definitely, a ch that's gonna be a challenge for interoperability, but I'm sure we'll be able to, uh, to find some, uh, uh, some solutions uh, around that. Um, from our side, the key aspect uh, we kind of um, paid attention at the beginning was really to lower down the infrastructure cost as much as possible to actually uh, uh, maximize the business case of future infrastructure project and increase uh, our chances to uh, to have those projects uh, all around the world. And so the, the the key aspect of transport technology is to have all the technology on the vehicle uh, to to keep the infrastructure as basic as possible. And even when it's basic, it remains quite expensive. And uh, so the, the, the aim from our side is really to have all the magnetic systems, propulsion, levitation uh, on the vehicle, which is uh, an aircraft based vehicle. So pretty much an aircraft uh, uh, without wings. Uh, for the audience, as you may understand, since we are um, kind of uh, at the equivalence of flying at 50 kilometers above ground, you need to have pressurized cabin and a structure which is much similar, much more similar to an aircraft than a train. Um, and also with weight uh, constraints. And having said that, so all the system and equipment installed on the vehicle and for the, the power system, uh, we're using a power rail 
similar to uh, what we can have for subway systems. So this is kind of key, um, key IP. It's been public uh, now and we're developing that. Um, we're well aware as well about the skepticism uh, around the uh, Hyperloop and as a, uh, being part of an ecosystem, it's our mandate as well to demonstrate that what we're doing is, uh, is viable and practical and, uh, and makes sense. So um, we're currently building a technology demonstrator. Uh, so we will be able to explain in details how the propulsion works, uh, the levitation, the power transmission, uh, and how that those vehicles could travel at 1,000 kilometers an hour. We plan to reveal that um, uh, next year. Uh, we'll have to see and monitor how the COVID works but, uh, or evolve, but uh, uh, we're confident that we'll be able to explain and, and, and build that to, uh, to the public. And in parallel, um, and also this is one of the challenge compared to um, public project run uh, 50 years ago is that as private company, we can afford to wait for the technology to be ready just to wake up and say, okay, where do I should start to build an infrastructure? Those are long-term projects and you need to, as a private company, again, we need to develop that in parallel. And I think that in Europe, this is one of the challenges we'll have to face uh, in the next uh, few months and few years is where can we start in a first corridor uh, so we can both do in parallel the development of the technology and the infrastructure project. And in Canada, we, we kind of had the chance to uh, uh, to discuss with a, a progressive government in the west of uh, uh, Canada. And we're currently doing it to connect two major cities, which are Calgary and Edmonton. So for those who are not familiar with that, I invite you to look at the map. So it's a 300 kilometers line. It's kind of an ideal candidate. It's straight, flat, uh, low density and, and good ridership. So uh, we're developing that. And some of the first phases of this infrastructure project uh, the objective is to use it for uh, the certification. So that's the plan and a few words I wanted to share with uh, all of you and happy to answer uh, uh, all the questions at the end. Thank you, Sebastien. Uh, also, thank you for the timing. And we have some questions already coming in in the chat. I remember to everyone, please do the Q&A or the chat to submit your question. And at the end, we will have a round of a question and answer. And I will ask my colleague also to support me in this exercise. So the last one in the order of the promoter, because it's called Zeleros, with the Z, uh, is, uh, 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 that will be, I think, uh, David Pistoni to present it. And I think you have a video, if I'm not mistaken. David, we cannot hear you. He's muted. Maybe we can just start playing the video. You have the video, you can play the video, yeah. Zanda, please. Perfect. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our workshop. I'm David Pistoni, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Celeros, the European company based in Spain, leading the development of a scalable Hyperloop system. Hyperloop is a massive development, pushing the boundaries of the current transportation model. And it is really important, first, to have a fluent and efficient coordination between the Hyperloop promoters, industries, and institutions in order to optimize the time and resources. And second, to be sure that our path is aligned with the European needs and included properly in the financial framework of the Commission. That's why we want to thank shift to rail for taking the lead and support the coordination of this global development in Europe. Europe gathers more than 200 years of experience in the development and operation of mass transport systems. From airplanes to complex infrastructures, and especially railway, Europe combines all the ingredients to have a leading role in the development of Hyperloop. As a context, based on our calculations, a consolidated Hyperloop network at European level could move up to 550 million passengers per year, with a 65 billion revenue opportunity annually and saving more than 1 billion tons of CO2 during its lifetime. In 2013, Elon Musk popularized the concept and launched a competition. We won two of the main awards for our unique design of a commercial Hyperloop system. So we decided to make it a reality, creating the company. 
and that's how Thereros was born. Today, four years later, Thereros is an example of how the Hyperloop development has evolved. We are an incredible team of over 50 engineers, researchers, and business experts, and involving more than 100 people together with our partners. We work hand in hand with industry leaders, research centers, and institutions as a strong ecosystem covering the different areas in this big project. Our base is Valencia, where you can find our office, workshops, and currently six Hyperloop prototypes in operation, validating and optimizing our core Hyperloop technologies. Also, we are connected internationally thanks to our investors and partners. And what makes Teleros unique? First of all, infrastructure represents the majority of the cost in projects like roads, high-speed rail, and maglev lines. And the same happens with Hyperloop. That's why Thereros' unique approach is based on minimizing infrastructure complexity, including the majority of the technologies in the vehicle. That way we can increase scalability for the long distance routes, reducing project costs. Secondly, instead of working at the space pressure levels, Thereros works at aviation pressure levels, which also simplifies system maintenance and ensures that part of the current safety and certification schemes can be directly applied which accelerates Hyperloop path to market. Of course, we, the Hyperloop promoters, are in a race to demonstrate that our technology is the most efficient one. And this is a moment to keep developing, demonstrating, and to be ready to put the physical results on the table. But also, we'll need to converge in some points. With the support of institutions and regulators, we can define a common roadmap to take decisions about how Hyperloop should be in Europe and then to regulate and standardize the required items, having safety, sustainability, and interoperability as a priority. As our next big milestone, at Teleros, we are working on a pioneering European Hyperloop development center in Spain, including a three kilometers test track and working together with a consortia of leading industry players. The center is planned to start construction next year, and it will be key to demonstrate the performance and scalability of the Hyperloop technologies, testing the different systems in operational conditions and high speeds. It will be open to universities, institutions, and companies with interest in this Hyperloop revolution in Europe. We are Celeros Hyperloop, and it is a pleasure to be here with you today, accelerating the Hyperloop development in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much also for this video from uh, Zeleros. Um, now we have, uh, uh, we go back to the commission and we'll have a, the closing uh, of these uh, presentations by uh, GRC. I think uh, Constantinos, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carlo. And uh, thank you for uh, having um, uh, the GRC in this event. Uh, if you can broadcast the presentation, So good afternoon again. I'm Kostadinos Gumas from the European Commission's Joint Research Center and together with my colleague, Michalis Christou, who have been following developments on Hyperloop for the GRC for the past two years or so. I have prepared a few slides that highlight how the GRC supports policy making in the European Union, in particular in the field of transport and the way in which we can support developments. Next please. So very briefly, some information, uh, the GRC's mission as the in-house science and knowledge service of the commission is to support European policies with independence throughout the whole policy cycle from anticipation and development to implementation and monitoring. Next slide. The GRC is located in five member states with uh, headquarters in Brussels and the biggest site in Italy where circumstances uh, by the way, is not the case nowadays. More than 3,000 people enter and site daily. Uh, next, next slide, please. So one pillar of the excellence derives from our, our laboratories. Uh, GRC relies on world-class facilities and it is supported by exceptional scientists. You can see in the photo some of the facilities for two of which I will say a few words. Next slide. For example, in the transport, the vehicle emission uh, laboratories include nine major state of far facilities capable of conducting emission tests on a variety of vehicles. 
Research findings have provided substantial scientific development of new elements in the European emission directives. Next slide. Uh, in the structural engineering domain, uh, including tunneling, the European Laboratory for Structural Assessment is a reaction wall used for testing the vulnerabilities of buildings to earthquakes and other hazards. It is the largest facility kind in Europe and one of the largest in the world, only exceeded in Japan. Next slide. Uh, a second pillar of JRC excellence is our analytical capacity. As an example, the Transport Research and Innovation Motor Information System, or TRIMIS, is the analytical support tool for establishing and implementing the European Commission's Strategic Transport Research and Innovation Agenda. Among its objectives is to map technology trends and capacities in transport. Next slide. The research we conduct, uh, whether it is uh, laboratory work or desk research or a combination of both, allows us to provide targeted support to policy. Often this is done by writing reports and this slide shows some examples, including uh, this report on the left, which focuses on uh, standardization needs for tunnel structures. I should also add uh, that the JRC is in charge of collecting and managing the information on the European standards for structural uh, known as those. Next slide. Uh, a third pillar of JRC excellence uh, relies on the capacity to involve citizens. The JRC nowadays implementing uh, living labs to engage citizens and different stakeholders in innovating and implementing solutions in the areas of transport and energy. Some startup companies have already been selected to co-design and test their innovative mobility solutions in our site in Italy, which has the perfect city-like uh, environment. Next slide which is actually a concluding, uh, I will conclude my presentation uh, focusing on Hyperloop. Uh, the JRC participates in two working groups, one at a European member state level and one at Hyperloop promoters level, uh, supporting DigiMove on issues of innovation, uh, sustainability assessment and safety, and providing input through presentations and conference or journal papers. Uh, we foresee that in the future, this engagement could be in other areas, include the definition of safety elements and also addressing safety concerns. Also the long uh, standing uh, JRC experience on uh, safety. In fact, we believe that uh, the JRC can support the European uh, Commission to regulate Hyperloop in Europe, uh, considering our experience and the necessary uh, multifaceted uh, research which is uh, needed. Uh, with this, I have concluded. Next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a few references, that's, and uh, if you need information, any additional information, uh, you can uh, address uh, or Michalis uh, directly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Constantinos. Thank you, Michalis. Well, thank you to all of you for having uh, uh, complied with the, the timing allocated to all of you. I saw we have already question in, in the system. Uh, so um, I will ask Goras to ask them. But first, uh, I think uh, what we would like to we have tried to, to present is uh, to define and set the scene with the Commission uh, policies and uh, with the policy makers. So Kier set the, uh, the scene. Uh, we had the presentation from the promoter, and now we have the presentation from GRC that shows, as uh, Sebastian said before, how the European Union uh, has, uh, is bringing forward its mandate to, let's say, as I use these words, respect uh, emerging technologies. And I think this is really something into which we believe and is part of also our role as a um, body dedicated to uh, ra rail, in particular research innovation, but I believe will be expanded in the future. So maybe Goras, can you go through the questions maybe? Yes, now? thank you, Carlo. <clears throat> so we have questions from the audience, quite a few actually, and I would start with the first one. What would be a suitable operational speed for Hyperloop vehicles developed by different companies? Who would like to answer? Denis, go ahead. Perfect. Thanks a lot for the question. I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I, in, in, in the SwissPod opinion, uh, I think the speed should be the, the second advantage uh, of the Hyperloop system. So. The first advantage should be the energy efficiency and sustainability 
of of the entire uh, transportation uh, mode of transportation. So I think the speed should be a consequence of an energy efficiency philosophy. So therefore, I would say that uh, a nominal uh, maximum speed in order to keep this mode of transportation efficient would be around 800 kilometers per hour. OK, thank you. Any other views on, from this point of view? If you raise your hand, I can see you would like to answer with uh, make it easier. No, maybe we go to the next question. Got it. OK, thanks. Uh, the next question is, there are several companies about this technology. Do you collaborate among each other to accelerate the technology? Which is your vision from this point of view? This is why one of the, the core question and we have our views. Bruce, mm -hmm. go ahead. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, we do. Um, and I must thank Carlo and the European Commission for establishing the Hyperloop Promoters Working Group. It's the only place in the world that has obviously allowed the Hyperloop companies to contribute, uh, to collaborate with each other and work on identifying, you know, agreed pathways forward. Everything from defining the Hyperloop system, talking about safety and safety systems, looking at our functional blocks and aspects of commonality with our system that we can openly talk about and leading that direction going forward. So we, we do have opportunities to collaborate. Um, we have further opportunities to collaborate now with the establishment of the Sen Senlec Joint Technical Committee 20 on Hyperloop standards at a European level, um, which obviously will have a, a global outreach. So the companies are all participating via their member state partners. Um, and even though we're an American, North American company, we're also participating with uh, with UNE in, uh, in Spain. So I'm happy to happy to let you know that there is a high degree of collaboration and Europe is the driving force on where that's happening. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Bruce. Anyone else would like to intervene on this? I'd like to just add to that. I can uh, thank you very much, uh, Bruce. Uh, agree with your points. I just wanted to also give the perspective of, uh, you know, in the end, one of the biggest features of Hyperloop could be that you have, um, as you can really build a network, right? With the things that also the different companies are working on with the switching. If you can really get a network where the systems are interoperable, where, you know, something that's built from Spain and something that's built in the end from Sweden, in the end also comes together at the center, it means that you can really uh, make a, an alternative for, uh, for short haul flights. Uh, so therefore, I think it's really key that we work towards interoperability. And, and from our perspective, interoperability is much more important than that our technology is the technology. It's, 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 in the end, we're trying to make something that really makes sense for, for us all as end users, right? And, and that is the ultimate integration we'll be going for. Thank you, Mars. Gorat, back to you. Yes, uh, so let's continue on integration. So you've shown different technologies, different uh, business models. How do you see uh, the evolution and the convergence towards, towards a system? Or do we need to create uh, uh, interoperable uh, system or just uh, contact points or stations between different systems? Are we looking for a future ERTMS of Hyperloop or we are looking for a system like aviation? Shemek, would you like to intervene? Please. Yeah, I would like to maybe to start because I think there will be a <laughs> lot of different voices on, on this. Uh, I would rather favor the interoperable whole system. If we want to reach a scale and we want to implement this fast, uh, we should think about uh, connect, you know, having, having this more or less the same standards for everyone and uh, and including as many players as possible the the market potentially will be huge so i think there's there's place for everyone uh, and if we end up uh, in trying just to interconnect the sy different systems at stations we may might have a similar situation which we had with with, uh, with maglevs which finally uh, didn't become super popular uh, and that's why, in our opinion, it's it's really a great job that the Commission Shift to Radio is doing, trying to bring all the parties together, and uh, and I think trying to to drive us into the first option, where where the standards would be same for everyone, uh, and and the more cooperative approach would prevail. 
Thank you. I think uh, maybe here you would like to bring or Carlo your views on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I rather share what's just been said, if it can be done. I mean, certainly, and I mean, for the benefit of the panelists you, uh, or for the audience who don't know me, uh, I'm normally head of uh, rail safety and interoperability for the commission. And we spend a lot of time in my job there trying to put right the fact that this rail has been around for the best part of 200 years in each member state and indeed sometimes individual bits of railway in different member states have sometimes very different technical standards and we're having to do a lot of work to put those together so actually we can have a much more streamlined and seamless system and of course to keep the costs down of the railway infrastructure. So clearly the ideal thing with Hyperloop if it is going to become a system and not just a, a series of individual um, bits of infrastructure, if it is going to be a system we should get interoperability to work from the beginning. But it is hard because, as you've seen from the presentations, uh, at the moment, the different Hyperloop promoters have very different conceptions of what Hyperloop would be in terms of speed, in terms of level of air pressure, uh, and very basic things like that. So until that's resolved, we can't really say this is how it's going to be. And of course, if we do start saying already this is how it's going to be, a lot of people who are on the call with us this afternoon will say, well, actually, that's not my technology. I think my technology is better. Uh, and we can't, as regulators, simply decide to go for high pressure or low pressure or whatever it is. We've, we've got to let the market decide to some extent. So the question is when we can regulate to bring interoperability. If we do it too early, we stop innovation. But if we do it too late, we, of course, prevent a, a good system developing at all, perhaps. And that, that's going to be the challenge for us over the next few years, seeing when it is right to intervene and quite how um, prescriptive we have to be in what we decide then to do. Thanks. Thank you, Kira. I will come back to you with the last question because there is a last question linked to the um, transport and mobility strategy that is expected by year end. So this will be the conclusive question. Uh, maybe Goraz, go yes, back. Uh, we can continue. There are quite yeah. a few questions coming in. Um, question concerning uh, collaboration with other modes. So what do you think, why do you think Hyperloop is closer to railways than to aviation? <laughs> Are you ready to comply with equivalent railway requirements concerning safety? And there is also a question related to this one, uh, whether uh, we are considering to collaborate with the aviation JUs as well. So how do you find yourself more near to aviation or more near to railway or how you find uh, uh, more similarity? Ga Mars, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, sure. No, I, I think it's what we always like to say is the, the vehicle is very much like an airplane without wings, uh, but the, the, the infrastructure has a, a lot of uh, 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 similarities with rail, of course, but then there's also an extra feature that yeah, sort of the, the, the low pressure in the pipe is actually lower than you usually use for aviation. We, we you know, we can learn things. We can take probably 70% of things that we know from rail, from aviation, but there's also an extra part that needs to come together. So I think that the, the most important thing here is um, we shouldn't say it is mostly real. It is mostly aviation. We need to learn from most of it, but also make something, especially for, uh, for Hyperloop, also because there's so many features that make it slightly different that you can just copy from one of the others. Sebastian, may I ask you which is your view? Yeah, so it's, it's similar to what Mars uh, just said. I think, uh, but um, as a complement, it's actually even broader than uh, uh, aviation and rail. Uh, we need to tap into uh, regulation done for the space industry as well. So I would add that. And even for uh, um, our technology, we're looking at what's been done for the nuclear industry, so for the infrastructure and inside the tube. And even, which is kind of uh, weird somehow, but the, the, the tube looks like a pipeline and there is interesting standards as well for, for pipelines which could be used. So that's why we, we, we really need to be careful. The good news is that um, we can, um, uh, we can take advantage and of all those existing standards, but we really need to have an open mind and look at everything which has been developed for other industries. Bruce, I thought that you wanted to intervene also. 
Yeah, I think the, there's an important, there's, there's two important parts. The first part is regulatory clarity. So for, for everybody to, for governments and and uh, environments to make the decision on where it will ultimately sit. We've seen in the United States that the US DOT and Net Council announced in July that uh, from a US perspective, it will sit with the Federal Railroad Administration um, based on the fact that it, it's aligned with a, a mode of surface transportation. Now, not discounting the fact that we are pulling in standards as best practice from all industries across rail. Uh, we've all spoken previously about the common safety method in the EU as a method to uh, assess risk. We've spoken about using EN5012678 with respect to the, the journey with, uh, with, our, with safety and the safety case. But also I think you'll see a, a balance where the expertise doesn't exist in a railway regulatory environment that expertise can be called in from other domains to help and support that. So um, for us as an industry, two parts we have to be focused on safety first and foremost and two the regulatory clarity is the most important thing that we uh, that we all seek uh, together and need to continue to work with the uh, with the uh, the various environments in which we uh, we operate thank you bruce uh, we have only nine minutes because we should have finished a bit before but i was able to extend a bit and we have up to seven o'clock and we have three questions that i think are quite interesting uh, maybe I will go ahead, uh, Goras, if you don't mind, so I will try to make a short selection. Uh, and I keep the last one, uh, the last one for later on. But one question is also about the environment. And someone said, have there been research activity concerning the environmental impact of the magnetic fields, mm. for example, of birds or animals and so on and so on? And, and uh, I know that some of you have done some... Um, uh, environmental impact as part of their activity. I think uh, HTT, if I'm not mistaken, but also most probably, you have anything from this point of view? I don't know if Charles or Mike would like to answer. Um, we did, uh, hold on. Yeah, you are fine. Go ahead. Yeah, am I visible? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we did a feasibility study. The environmental uh, impact study would be the next stage. We did the okay. feasibility study in the Emirates and one for the Great Lakes connecting uh, Chicago to Pittsburgh. So the envi our environmental impact study would be next. Okay. That's the stage two where we are actually working on. Okay. So I cannot so we... uh, give you a, a clear answer to that. Okay, we can give you, we will come back one year. Dennis, I see you want to intervene, go ahead. So also building the infrastructure here, uh, we have done such an analysis because we're asked by the uh, by the city uh, where we are building this in, uh, such, a, such a study. So we proved in, uh, uh, in that document that this is not dangerous. Uh, and this document will be uh, made publicly probably in the, in the next year. Thank you. This is very good for, to know. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question back to the commission uh, and this is quite interesting. I said, will Hyperloop feature in the mobility strategy uh, for the 20, 20, that we expect at the end of 2020. So that I think is expected in December by now. And also I would add something else is uh, quite an interesting one about the supply industry. How do we capitalize on the market potential for suppliers, making sure we don't end up with a five or six big supplier dominating things and no real competition. Here, <laughs> you have been also working in cabinets. So I think you are the, the most, uh, uh, I yes, th th thank you for those two interesting <laughs> questions, Carlo. Uh, I, I mean, the first one, of course, it's slightly difficult for me to give a full answer because, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the proposal for the, uh, the sustainable, um, smart and sustainable mobility strategy is still uh, going through the, the final process with our cabinets and with our commissioners, so it will be announced uh, later in the year, and I can't tell you precisely what's in it. What I think I can say now, though, of course, is that Hyperloop, though we see it as something which has a lot of potential, is not something which is actually yet there. Um, there is no Hyperloop in commercial or even pre-commercial operation anywhere in the world. I think probably the Great Lakes uh, project is uh, the most advanced. So I, I think it would be probably premature to see it featuring in a big way in the strategy. But um, equally, what I can say is that the Commission is, of course, as I said in my uh, opening presentation, 
we, we are very keen to find every way possible of addressing the challenges that are posed by the strategy, by the needs for decarbonisation. So if the, the potential that we see in Hyperloop is realised, then I'm sure we will be wanting rapidly to, to assist it uh, becoming part of the European transport mix. But I, as I say, I wouldn't expect to see more than a few sort of pegs for that in the, in the strategy uh, later in the year. In terms of how we deal with the industrialization of it, I mean, again, of course, it's, it's very premature, and I'm sure there are lots of people sitting on the, uh, on the panel this afternoon who would uh, like their companies to become very big players in this. Um, but I think this is where standardization actually comes in, because clearly, if it's going to work, we need there to be big players who can develop good technology rapidly and get it into the market. But equally, I think the people who will be buying this technology will be much more confident in doing so if there are several suppliers who can help them build the system so they don't have supplier lock-in or even worse, they don't face stranded costs if for whatever reason their supplier actually goes under and nobody can deliver for them. And I think that is where developing a strong sort of standards-based system uh, and some kind of uh, overall regulatory framework comes in because then everybody can produce components and to some extent compete with each other. It's actually, again, exactly the same as we're now trying to do in rail, build up a system architecture where, sure, there's space for competition, but there is also space for, um, sort of where there's space for innovation and individual companies doing their own thing, but there is also space for a degree of competition for at least some sort of key basic elements of the structure. Thank you, Kia. Last question to everyone. And I will ask, please, the order uh, we started with the presentation. And the last question is simple, but um, I would like to hear your, your answer. So we start uh, with the Pshemek. Uh, but the question is, it seems that 2030 is the Hyperloop starting date. Are you sure that we can get it? Are promoters considering interoperability in their design? We have already discussed about it. So the question is, it seems that 2030 is the Hyperloop starting date. Are you sure, Shemek, that we are there by 2030? Well, I, I'm quite sure. I think it's even it's even a bit sooner as far as as far as we know already. Of course, it depends a lot on, on the regulatory framework and, and safety issues, uh, which has been uh, named here so many times that I don't think it's it's useful to to, to say it once again. Uh, for our Magrail system, I think it, it's going to be before two, 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 2025. For Hyperloop, we believe it's going to be around 25, 27, maybe. You know, it depends how we make the definition of a system, right? But having so, uh, seeing so much improvements and advancement, advancements being done in the last few years, we are quite, quite optimistic. Thank you. Thank you. So I follow the order of before presentation. So I think Bruce is up to you now. Same question. I'm going to answer with a definitive absolutely. So with the, with the movement and the development of the Hyperloop Certification Centre in the US, we've made it very clear through that announcement and the development of our technology that we are moving towards certification by 2025. That is an absolute with the commercial services beginning before the end of the decade. So before 2030, you'll absolutely see certified system um, ready for commercial services by then. So definitive yes from my side, Carlo. Thank you very much, Bruce. Mars? Um, yeah, we think that for passenger service, you'll, you'll need more time. You'll need more time to really have it into a commercial setting. You're, you're really operating. You can have uh, uh, facilities and certification facilities running for passengers by that time. And we also think that we can get, um, uh, and, and the, you know, the, the, the issues are also, you know, usually the planning phase for large scale infrastructure like this, it takes, takes you know, longer than actually the development of the system, right? So this, uh, you have to take all of that into account. But <laughs> we do think that before the end of this uh, decade, we could have a first, maybe on a smaller scale, a cargo commercial application. Uh, that will uh, also uh, help, uh, you know, pave the way toward passenger uh, applications. Thank you, Mars. Charles or Mike, what, which is your view? I will, uh, I will take the honor. Thank you, uh, Carlo. And I can only repeat uh, what uh, Bruce has said, and absolutely yes. Uh, for our company, I can say that we are working on the, the next stage of our development is a prototype, commercial prototype of five 
kilometers, uh, full scale, of course. Um, we hope to do that three years after closing the financing. The financing we hope to close in the next months, next year. We don't know exactly. It's, it's a lot of money. Um, so prototype that will be up and running in three years time. From there on, we can certi start certification. So 2030, that is absolutely reasonable. Um, it will not be a, a network uh, Europe that will cover Europe, but it will at least show that the, the system is viable. Uh, so we are very much in line with what uh, Bruce just said. And I think also the, we expect a little bit of support in that sense. We can speed up the development. Uh, as we have seen in the US, uh, Hyperloop is eligible for public funding and support. We would very much like to see this uh, in Europe as well. Uh, Europe took a leadership role uh, with, the, with these Hyperloop coordination meetings. Uh, the US has been taking, is taking the lead with making it uh, uh, fundable, uh, ready for public funding. So we cannot lose that opportunity in Europe. We really should take that, uh, that opportunity. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, we have now, I think, uh, Swisspod. So, um, Denis? Uh, we think that it's too much saying that by 2030, we can travel inside the high proof system. But what I might say is that by 2030, the technology will be there to be used. OK, perfect. Thank you, Denis. Uh, Sebastian. Yes, you have a quite so, uh, advanced project. You were talking about uh, Edmonton, Calgary. So, yeah, so 2030 is um, the date we're aiming to, uh, to operate this line. Um, but there is no, I would say, buffer. <laughs> uh, there is no buffer. Um, all the starts need to be aligned. And um, you also need to take into account, so of course, the certification of the technology and uh, the construction of the line. And uh, we are uh, forecasting five years of construction uh, to connect, so it's a 300 kilometers line. So whoever is uh, aiming for a longer route, uh, just as an example, the, the high-speed rail corridor uh, to connect Bordeaux to Paris in France, it took seven to eight years to be built. And many infrastructure projects takes longer than that. Uh, and in order to, um, to respect that uh, objective, it means that we need to have a regulatory framework ready within the next three years and to be able to certify the technology between, I would say, 2025 and 2027. And uh, so there's lots of work ahead of us. I'm not saying that it's not possible, uh, but um, there is, uh, we need to be more ambitious. Like to go back to the initial questions about is Hyperloop part of the agenda or not? I'm surprised that it's, we all, I would say, still hesitating about that. That should be a strong yes. And if we want to innovate and address climate change, we need to be more ambitious. This is what people are expecting from politicians. And I'm glad that Europe is kind of moving in that direction. We need to be even stronger on that. Thank you, Sebastian. Here is back to you, this. Eh? <laughs> yeah. uh, we have now, uh, I think, uh, Zeleros. So, so we have David with us. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, Carlo. From our side, we, we bet for 2030 as the year to have the technology ready. And we hope also to have the regulations uh, prepared for, for uh, implementing these Hyperloop routes. But also, we think it depends on, on two main points. First one is we have to cooperate uh, to find this roadmap to converge. Uh, today is a good example of what we are trying to do, and this is the good path. And, and also the second point is it's going to depend on what kind of technology finally we are looking for in, in Europe. Uh, so depending on, on the kind of technology, in our, our case, for example, we are working at the airplane pressures. So it's, it's closer to, to market in this sense and depends on how we define the Hyperloop for Europe, we are going to be uh, faster or, or slower uh, reaching this uh, certification we need to, to operate with the technology. Thank you, David. I, I, now I go to JRC, now I'm putting difficulty Constantinos because uh, while well, you are the scientific in-house uh, uh, department of the commission, I will not ask you the question is uh, 2030 or not, but uh, uh, well, you explained that the GRC effectively is uh, dealing with a lot of complex system and uh, we require a lot of safety. I think uh, 
the challenge is tough by 2030. Well, Carlo, if I may say, I'm more in favor of setting uh, intermediate targets instead of, uh, let's say, setting a deadline. I know for a company that wants to make profit, maybe this does not make uh, much sense, but uh, uh, this would be the case. Uh, we, I would like to emphasize the, the progress made within the meetings organized by the European Commission, facilitated by Safe to Rail. We have seen very, some very high quality approaches on safety issues which uh, maybe is the most important aspect. So I'm looking forward to continue working with that group, uh, with the Harvard promoters and uh, make this happen eventually for 2030. Thank I you. think you concluded perfectly the meeting uh, because I think this is actually what, where we have to do. I think uh, many words have been uh, mentioned tonight, interoperability, infrastructure, vehicle, aircraft or rail, financial support, that is another key element. But at the end, as you said, the progress we achieve working together is really what makes the change. And I think we have a collective responsibility also in our role, institutional roles, to ensure that we don't become a barrier to bring a new possible transport modes um, to life during the decade. But on the contrary, we accelerate the time. I think this is uh, what we can take uh, out from uh, this session. I would like to thank you all of you for your uh, kind participation. I hope also for the audience has been a, an interesting uh, session. It's one of the sessions quite late in the evening at, with the highest participant uh, between the, all the other sections of the day. So well done to everyone. Uh, and uh, uh, please join us again tomorrow morning at nine o'clock uh, when we have the second day dedicated and we start uh, uh, with the session in which uh, uh, we hope to have uh, back uh, Commissioner Valian and uh, the freight session. Uh, and also, uh, well, uh, please follow up uh, the, the progress uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, multi-annual financial framework, because this will can create a clear opportunity for the funding and, and financing. And uh, uh, I hope uh, next year uh, to have a new session dedicated to Hyperloop and uh, to see the progress that you have achieved. Enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the organization. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye.